from Zechariah Tiemens, who says, Do you worry about the increasing antiquation of cinematic classics? For example, most Westerns today are unrecognizable in terms of the modern movie structure, and modern audiences have long since abandoned the relative cheesiness of shows like Star Trek, the original series. Um, I personally think, I don't know if it's Star of Flame War here, I personally think Star Trek, the original series, is a lot less cheesy than Next Generation or any of the other ones, frankly. I think it's a lot cleaner and, a, and dramatically a lot better. Um, I was watching Lost in Space again. <laughs> uh, <coughs> I, I thought that was a serious show when I was a kid. It's a, it's, that show is designed for kindergartners. I don't know how it got on the air. I don't know how it got on the air. Just the props alone on Lost in Space. Forget Jonathan Harris and Dr. Smith. Uh, I don't know how the show made it on a, on a major network. And the first season of Lost in Space was so cool. It was just really a cool space adventure and immediately just de degenerated into this camp. A lot of people point out that um, Batman had a big influence on it, but I don't know. Anyway, uh, when you look at how badly that show is written and how well Star Trek can be written, the original series is amazing. Um, but, so the whole, the question goes to antiquation of the genre. Um, and I think that's a really, po really good point. You can make a Western today, but you certainly can't make the kind of Westerns they made in, um, in the 40s. You just can't make those kind of movies anymore. Uh, although I want to just grab that and pull it right back and say, I bet you can. Uh, it's just that people don't. Um, it's very... We talked in the last episode about how uh, one of the reasons the anti-hero became so popular in Hollywood was because the structure of the heroic movies that the anti-hero movies replaced was just so awful. It was just so dull. And that's the worst thing that, that entertainment can be is dull. It can be annoying. It can be maddening. It can be, um, it can be so bad it's good, but it can never be dull. If it's just dull, it's awful. And, and as we said before, you know, uh, Paint Your Wagon and Seven Brides for Seven Brothers and all that nonsense, uh, there was a rebellion against that. And that rebellion is with us today. And, and because that counter, because that revolution against the kind of classical uh, 50s Hollywood, you know, boredom fest you got paint your wagon on one hand and you've got easy rider on the other or midnight cowboy or um dog day afternoon or um anything like that or um or uh the godfather you know anti-hero anti-movie in terms of the traditional values of this country is a, a movie about the mafia that certainly doesn't portray them in a good light, but there's no question that, you know, Michael Corleone is, a, is an anti-hero. Uh, uh, Vito, especially when he's played by um, uh, Robert De Niro in the second movie, is a, is a hero, but not a hero. He's a hero who's a murderer. But it's interesting. It's much more interesting than, than that, you know, Doris Day, um, Rock Hudson crud. Um, the, uh, there were great movies made in that time. You know, you look at things like North by Northwest or, or Psycho or any of that stuff. So it's not like it was all bad, but a lot of it was bad. And we forget how bad a lot of it was. I remember going to the movies as a kid and I have no memory of what I saw at all. None of it. Stuff was just junk. So to answer your question, Zechariah, the, the, um, I think the, the tone is changing. Um, and yet some films are still pretty timeless. I just glanced up and saw something from PAX 77-1, Singing in the Rain holds up. Casablanca holds up. Uh, uh, Wizard of Oz holds up. Um, and a bunch of them do. Uh, Citizen Kane holds up. But in the case of like Wizard of Oz as its own little world and you know, you kind of, you're willing to get into that world, Citizen Kane is a dark film in the same way that um, you know, The Godfather is a dark film. You, you can almost connect those two films pretty closely you know, corruption of power and all that other stuff. So the question is, can you go back to these older forms? I don't, I don't think you can go back, but I think you can go forward to the same kind of message. Um, one of the things that uh, McKay wrote about in that book, and I don't think this was his quote, I think it was attributed to somebody else. It might have been attributed to Plato or Aristotle. But somebody said, um, somebody said that you, you have to give your audience what they want. You, there are a lot of movies that don't, that intentionally deprive you of what you want. Um, the ending of The Sopranos is a great example of depriving you of what you want. I mean, oh, we're going to let you decide what happened. Okay, but that's not what people want. They want an answer. Does Tony Soprano live or die? We want to know. We've been with him for, what, 11 years? We'd like to know. Um, but they're not going to let us know. Okay. 
you can't basically say screw you to your audience. And when George Lucas had his hands on Star Wars, that's all he did. We're going to give you Jar Jar Binks. Everybody hates Jar Jar Binks. Well, too bad for you. He's there. Uh, everybody hates it when, uh, at the end of the movie, when Darth Vader, at the end of the third movie, goes, no, people laughing out loud, laughing out loud. And then they start backing in the nose into pre-existing parts of the original trilogy. It was kind of F you to, the, um, to, to his audience. You can't do that. But the point in this book that was so interesting to me was they said the way you really, the way you should structure a film is you should structure a film so that you give the audience what they want, what they want, but not how they were expecting it. That's a profound, profound, profound insight and, and typical of the genius of this badly written book. It's a profound insight. Give the audience what they want, but not in the way they're expecting it. That's what a movie has to do. And a movie that does that succeeds. Because if it gives you what you want in a way that you're expecting it, then why even watch the movie? Of the many, many, many profound things, I've been trashed to the book for 10 minutes, I'll, I'll, I'll sing some praises for it. Of the many, many profound things in that storybook, the book of sto you know, story by McKay, I think the most profound insight that he had was that we think, Hollywood thinks that your audience is stupid, that, you know, there's just, you know, it's good enough. You know, what, well, what about this part where the, uh, where the uh, you know, this, this woman lands a Chinese space capsule after jumping from one capsule to another to another? She's a doctor. She's never flown a capsule before in her life. People aren't going to believe she lands a space capsule. And people in Hollywood go, no, the audience will buy it because they're stupid. You know, they're really very stupid people out there. McKay says, on the contrary, on the contrary, on the contrary, on the contrary, what he says is, how many times have you been in a movie and had the audience already, by the time you're a third of the way film through the film, say, that's the bad guy. Even though, even though he's not supposed to be the bad guy, I know that even though he's trying to be like the good guy, we know that the big reversal is going to be he's going to be the bad guy. How many times have you anticipated a reversal in a film? How many times have you seen the, um, the big, you know, the big uh, uh, flip ending coming, like a train? Um, m most of the time. And what, and what um, McKay is saying here is that he's saying what that means is the audience is so smart and they're living in such a heightened state of information processing, even though it's rather passive, that they're able to determine the things that you as a writer have spent two years trying to hide. You know that at the end this guy's going to, the best friend is revealed to be the enemy spy. Most people have that figured out in Act One, buddy. Um, so this is, this, is, uh, this is not the way to think of an audience, not to think of them as, as stupid you got to think of them as, as brilliant and that is kind of is kind of it as far as the the structure of things so give them what they want but not in a way they expected so back to the original question um, you i don't think you can go back and and tell stories the way they were told but i think you can go back to the morals and the and the messages of of older movies and come back to that exact same place in a different way uh, this goes to how society changes over time and how it's essentially a ratchet. You can't really undo it. I don't know how you would undo it I within the same culture. For example, um, my favorite example of, uh, of a screenwriting convention is, is this. The, I, think the, I think of all of the entertainment I've seen in my life, I think my favorite single piece of entertainment is Deadwood, the, the TV Western that was on uh, HBO between about 2003 and 2004 four or five, somewhere in there. Uh, three seasons of the show, and it got a little weaker as it went on, but I just thought that taken as, as a thing, as, as a thing, like Breaking Bad is a thing or Walking Dead is a thing, I thought Deadwood was the best thing I've ever seen. I thought it was the best acted, best written thing I've ever seen. It was very minimally written. I loved it. I thought, I thought Al Swearing is one of the greatest characters ever. Um, and I loved it. I still love it. Now, Here's what's interesting about Deadwood, and, and believe it or not, I do actually have a chance to come back to a point here. In Deadwood, Deadwood is not only one of the most interesting shows I've ever seen, it's without question the most profane show, I think, ever on television. I think it's the most profane show ever written. They used to have drinking contests for see how many times this certain word would come up uh, and how many times, you know, Al Swearingen would be said in the show. It was... It was... Um, incredibly profane show. And after two or three seasons of this, I saw an interview with David Milch, I think was the guy who did it, um, and he was asked, I think a really profound question, his answer blew me away. He said, somebody asked him, he said, this, you know, F word, S word, 
compound adjectives is simply the most profane show in the world. And somebody said, did the miners and the people in the town of Deadwood at the time in the 1880s or whatever it is, did they actually speak that way? Is that the actual language that they used? And he said something that just was so deep and so profound to me. He said, no, they did not use these words. They would use words like damn and bastard and, you know, goddamn and things like that. That was the worst language they had. He said, but they used the worst language they had in order to set up a protective shield around themselves to make them seem tougher than they were and to keep other enemies from messing around with them. And he said the essence of what they were doing was they were using the most foul language they could to put a force field around themselves. And he said, therefore, for this to make sense to the modern audience, we can't use the worst language they have. We have to use the worst language we have. And I thought, okay, got it. That's it. And so what you see time and time again, that's why I'm glad we did a show business show, what you see time and time again in theater and the arts and movies that I love and think is appropriate is fatal in the actual world of real politics. And that is the idea that there is a larger truth behind the actual truth. In the real world of politics and science, there is no larger truth. There's no philosophical truth that trumps the actual data. There's no philosophical world of, of a universe of utopias that trumps what you have to do to try to get there, and you can't get there from here. You can't. It's just wishful thinking in the real world, and we got to fight the idea it's a larger truth. We don't report on Barack Obama because even though this is what he did was wrong or treason or lying, we all know that it's for the larger truth, for the larger good, so we're not going to report on him. That's killing the country in the real world, but that's the nice thing about the theater, and that's the nice thing about working in both these worlds. In, in show business, the larger truth actually does outweigh the 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 real truth. It's a bigger truth. So the example of Deadwood is so profound to me because if you had seen Deadwood and you'd seen these guys saying, darn it, or you tell that bastard, or damn you, and that was the worst they had, it would sound like a tea party to us. It would say, well, you know, dainty women's tea party. Uh, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't sound real. And by using the worst language we have in order to show that they were using the worst language they had, it does feel real. It feels like a violent, aggressive, dangerous, mean, terrible place where anything can go wrong at any given time. And that's artistic truth. So that's the kind of example I think I'm, I would answer you with here, Zechariah. I think if you wanted to tell a story about traditional values, you can, but you can't have the bad guys say, I've got to tinkle now. It just doesn't work. And I said I didn't think there was any way to go backwards, and there isn't. I don't think there's any way to go backwards with the asterisks. Is there any way to go backwards on this? No. Asterisks. In other words, this culture cannot suddenly undo the language. We can't go back to saying, gosh darn it, and heck. We can't. I can't imagine a way in which that would happen. Where's the asterisk? What does the asterisk mean? Well, the asterisk means that we can't go backwards in a culture, but that doesn't mean that you can't have another culture where this kind of thing does in fact reset. And as a matter of fact, I think it does not not only possible, I think it's likely. For example, the behaviors of the Romans was appalling. Even by modern standards of, of Americans, it's appalling. It's not appalling by the standards that people live over the hill in Hollywood. They live it every day. But decadence comes on a society, and as society gets more decadent, becomes more decadent. And I've never heard of a case of a society becoming undecadent in the long term. But what can happen is that society can collapse down to the boulders and the rubble, and then a new society comes out of that society, and uh, then you start again. You s wipe the slate clean. But the problem is the slate gets wiped clean, and we're on the slate right now. So it's a little alarming. But I, th I think it's a really interesting question. You know, Clint Eastwood in Unforgiven made a modern Western that in the still had a lot of the older Western values. I like that movie very much. And American Sniper is in many ways a very pro-American, well, not in many ways, in every way. It's a pro-American, pro-U.S. military, pro-Iraq war, pro, 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 pro movie. But it's not, it's not Sergeant York. It's not Sergeant York. Uh, you don't see, um, you don't see Chris Kyle uh, riding uh, on a motorcycle and gets struck by lightning and have a come to Jesus moment where he crawls into a church in the rain and stands up there and is, and is forgiven. It just, you just, it doesn't happen um, because people wouldn't buy it. 
even though um, it's a very pro-American movie, uh, he he still has a very dark side to him. Um, you can tell he's suffering, you know. He's suffering a lot. Ah, good question, though. Moving on. Uh, 